Let me start by asking you a question. Do you remember the last time you read or watched something online that you really disagreed with? It could be something like a, a news story, a comment on Facebook, or a YouTube clip. It wasn't a very nice feeling, was it? Especially if you felt that, although you disagreed with someone, they actually made a good point. I at least think it's an awful feeling. But although it's uncomfortable, we all know that it might be wise to expose yourself to disagreement. TED Talks and political discussions are all about learning new ideas and perspectives. But not only the ideas we agree with. In many well-functioning democracies around the world, people are encouraged to step out of their comfort zones and listen to those they disagree with. To get a more complete picture and perhaps learn that they are sometimes wrong. And here in Norway, it's not only wise to expose yourself to disagreement, it is also a democratic ideal that is anchored in the Constitution. But in my talk today, I asked the question, is new technology making this ideal of exposure to disagreement harder or easier to accomplish? And to answer that question, I want us to go back in time. In 2011, 10 years ago, the writer and journalist Eli Pariser stood on a similar stage as this one and gave a TED talk that now has almost 6 million views. He talked about how algorithms on the web tailor information to each and one of us and filter out ideas and perspectives we disagree with. For instance, your Facebook newsfeed will be different from your Facebook newsfeed. Not only because you have different contacts on Facebook, but also because Facebook's recommender algorithms cease to show you content that is, is especially relevant to you. And Paris have warned that such algorithms had a capacity to learn how we behave online. And we know through decades of research that people tend to seek out information they agree with rather than information they disagree with. And this also shapes our online behavior. I mean, think about it. How often do you click like or share on a Facebook post that you disagree with? And because these algorithms are often programmed to learn your preferences and then show you more relevant content, they could also learn our preferences for content we agree with. If so, these algorithms could also filter out opinions and ideas we disagree with, because it assumes that like-minded content is more relevant and more engaging. Then, we are heading into what Paris coined our own filter bubble. A filter bubble is a world online created by recommender algorithms where you rarely meet or see content you disagree with because the algorithm narrows what content you consume. But during the last 10 years, we have learned through tons of great research a lot of the negative effects of such algorithms. But the findings from these studies may come as a surprise to many of you. In fact, it seems that the problem of filter bubbles is quite small. Most of us still see a lot of stuff in our social media feed that we disagree with. But I should also mention that there are some studies that show evidence of a filter bubble. But the general picture is that if there really is something like online filter bubbles, only a few people live within. And importantly, much of this isn't only about the algorithms, but also about our own behavior and who we have as contacts on social media. It seems that only a small part can be blamed on the algorithms, at least directly. For instance, a large study uh, on Facebook in the US showed that, on average, American partisans were about 6% less likely to see content they disagree with due to Facebook's algorithm. But although we know a lot about the extent of the problem, 
Much of the algorithmic technology is still a black box that we don't know much about. Because we can study the effects of different algorithms, such as those on Facebook, but we know, don't know how their algorithms work. We only get to peek in from the outside. And this also means that, although we know uh, that algorithms don't tend to filter out information we disagree with, we don't know why. And without addressing this question of why, we don't know whether these algorithms are simply bad at doing their jobs, or whether most algorithms are designed to provide people with relevant content and show people information they disagree with. This means that we lack knowledge to make informed choices about how algorithms should be designed if the goal is to prevent the filter bubbles that Pariser warned about. And this is where I and my team come in. At the Media Futures Research Center at the University of Bergen, we work together with the media industry to find out how we can develop responsible media technology for the future. In a brand new project called the NewsRec project, we will address the why question by studying the conditions under which algorithms shape people's exposure to, this, to disagreement. To do so, my team and I will need full control of the design of the algorithms we study. And because it's virtually impossible to gain full access to tech firms' algorithms, we will design our own algorithm. We are now in the process of developing the first recommender algorithm that is equipped with factors that should increase or decrease people's exposure to disagreement. And to ensure that our results are valid not only in the lab, but also in the real world, we will collaborate with the news industry and test our algorithm on real-world news sites in a way that lets us, as researchers, study the effects of the algorithm. And uh, although the results of this work is in the future, we have already started doing studies on how such algorithms could work. This spring, we worked together with a leading Norwegian news company and did a survey with a representative sample of the Norwegian adult population. Inside this survey, people could browse a news site that looked similar to a well-known Norwegian news site, and importantly, where my team and I had full control over what was going on. We found that if people use a news site that is programmed to highlight content they agree with and downplay content they disagree with, then people are more, less likely to expose themselves to disagreements. In other words, we can see signs of the filter bubbles that Paris have warned about 10 years ago. But if we instead program an algorithm to do the opposite, to highlight content they disagree with and downplay content they agree with, then people are more likely to expose themselves to disagreement. And then, there's no sign of a filter bubble. This means that people are more or less likely to start on the path towards the filter bubble, depending on what the algorithm is designed to do. And this is important. Because after Paris' TED talk, many tech firms started taking the issue of filter bubbles seriously. In 2018, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey was quoted saying, I think Twitter does contribute to filter bubbles, and I think that's wrong of us. We need to fix it. And what my team and I have started to show in our research is that this is possible. Exposure to disagreement can either be amplified or narrowed, depending on the choices that tech firms make when they design their algorithms. And over the coming four years, my team and I will use this knowledge to further investigate how tech firms and the media industry can design algorithms that give us relevant uh, and engaging content without also narrowing our exposure to disagreement. My hope is that the work we will carry out here in Bergen can prepare the ground for a more nuanced discussion on the promise and perils of recommended algorithms. Because the negative or the positive effects of algorithms aren't really about the effects of the algorithmic technology. <coughs> it's
is about the effects of how algorithms are designed and what they are designed.